and welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple. One of the men, one of the many madmen who's shown who's shown up in and around the sphere system, in, in whether it be covering spheres itself or covering some of it, some of the expansions he's done, and now com now returning with Arc Forge, with a lot of Arc Forge, <laughs> Jesus, that's a lot of Arc Forge. Mm -hmm. The one and only Matt Daly, better known as the Squid Baron. How you Hello, Belter. Good to be back. As my cop rock Aerophone says, glad to see you're back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you knew you weren't getting away you weren't getting away from bad jokes that easy. Yep. <laughs> ha. So, oh, there's gonna be plenty more. I ex I expect that kind of thing. So Yep. As I as I understand it, Arc Forge is a universe of sci fi adventures. So I think the first question to ask is what sort of science fantasy are we dealing with? What would be the material in the Appendix N of Arc Forge? Well, um, science fantasy is kind of a tricky way to put it, but um, what I like to call it is future fantasy. Because a lot of its elements are based on the ideas of what happens when we take a fantasy culture and push it forward a few centuries, a few millennia, just to see, like, how far the technology and social development goes. And that takes a few different forms over the course of the setting itself. Arc Forge, as a setting, is divided into three different locations that are all connected to each other, but have very different aesthetics and themes based on the technologies, magic, and other elements that the people within have access to. You have the original world of Vandara, which is a planet much like our own in a lot of ways, um, with, albeit, magic and some more advanced technological infrastructure that is currently locked in, in a wide array of complex socio-political disputes. Um, which is the nearest future fantasy. You have Orin, which are the abandoned space colonies that were created and left behind by the planet of Vandara, which, after it became trapped within a bubble of its own space junk, left them to fend for themselves and develop into a cowboy bebop or expanse-style planet-hopping culture. And then beyond that, you have, well, the Beyond, a gathering of all of the other galactic cultures and communities that have emerged, which have reached some form of faster than light travel and have, in some cases, gone even further than that to travel along one of the seven Logi, the extensive paths of technological and magical advancement, which lead to points of no return mm -hmm. all three of these places are connected all three of them have common themes of progress development and understanding and all three regions come with plenty of their own clusterfucks and conflicts which players can engage in yeah and i think i think one of the important questions to ask when dealing with a a um a spacefaring affair is mm -hmm. the is the ftl question it's obviously mm -hmm. hopping between planets on normal propulsion is going to be way too damn long so there's i mean like not in orin that one is a setting that is just one solar system so that's a place that is a place where like, hopping between planets at slower than light speed is really the only way to go. And they've made it work. Alright, so next question, how? Well, 
teleportation spells can like get people between places, but more typically, they just have created engines that are fast enough to span a um, yeah to span from planet to planet in weeks or months time. It's kind of a new age of sail in that way because there are locations that have like distant communication, but at the same time. It'll take a while to reach any given location, and that creates a massive open frontier that is rife for intrigue and exploration. Players might go out and pursue a distress signal for some ship that was lost in the midst, or maybe they go to some moon where they find a like hidden group of castaways or potentially smugglers that are operating some sort of shady business. Um, the lack of FTL creates a sense of distance within Orin itself that I think makes it feel a lot bigger and a lot scarier. Um, and even though it is only one solar system, I did want to emphasize just like how many different things can still consolidate in a smaller area of space. That said, if you want to talk about the FTL question in regards to the beyond, that is actually a very big part of it. The main, uh, the main method that people use for FTL in the beyond is a mechanism known as shadow board, mm -hmm. which are thin points between the material plane and the shadow plane where they don't exactly sync up properly. The shadow plane, um, as you might be familiar from either Pathfinder or D&D, is basically a reflection of the material plane. A projection of it that is created from a template. The catch is, when someone travels at faster than light speeds through the material plane, they leave behind essentially a giant tunnel through the shadow plane that anyone else with access to what's known as a shadow bore can essentially follow on their tails for faster than light speed. The result is that a whole bunch of different galaxies and solar systems in the beyond are connected through the shadow bore creating a web that is somewhat similar to the choke points found in the video game Stellaris or in one of my favorite sci-fi novels, Joe Haldeman's Forever War. Mm -hmm. As for the as for the methods that like lead to those shadow boards being created, this is where we get into the low guy. One of my favorite aspects of the lore of the beyond, which are the seven cultures, or rather, pathways that cultures can advance down, that each have a unique form of FTL that is tied to their philosophy in some way, with a unique drawback and advantage to it. Do you want me to go through all of them right now in detail, or should I just give you these cliff notes on the seven? Um, we're probably going to go through cliff notes, because if we go through in detail on, on every part of the setting, we're going to be here for days. Since I know yep. that there's a lot of material when it comes to Arc Forge, the main oh gosh, yeah. The main thing that I wanted to dive into with, with that is to get a feel for what style of um, SF we're de we're dealing with. Since saying mm -hmm. SF or saying F SF meet slash fantasy or even future fantasy, that's a very wide net to cast. Yeah, um, so and that's kind of why I've segmented the setting in mm -hmm. the way I did. Now. That br that brings, and the thing is, there's like twelve. There's been like twelve different books for mm -hmm. the, for um, this. Eleven, yeah, eleven actually. But there's also kind of a zero with Arc Forge book that I have added to this compilation. Yeah, mm -hmm. and that being um, Tears from the Id, um, which contains a lot of the psionic powers from this book. Mm -hmm. And it's. It's funny that we bring up psionics. I'm gl I'm glad that you brought that up because one particular thing that's been tricky over the years is implementing psionics in a world in worlds where magic already exists. Mm -hmm. The you end up with a lot of situations where psionics is just another form of magic, 
instead of something mm -hmm. that stands on its own. So with Psyon with Psyonix and their and their equivalent in Arc Forge, um, how do you how do you ensure that it stands on its own? That it's not just magic in a different coat of paint. Well, one of the big things that I tried to do to make them distinct is to give magic and psionics separate and meaningful roles within both Arc Forge's story and its history. Um, the planet of Orin, no, the planet of Vandara in the system of Orin was actually artificially created by the dragons, which were a spellcasting focused society, but. Many of the peoples of Vandara were actually created by a society of psionic specialists known as the Outer Lords. And the conflicts between the dragon and the Outer Lords kind of influenced everything since by, in terms of both the creatures that were left behind by both of them and the technologies that they both employed, magics and psionics, to reshape the planet and the surrounding worlds to their will. Um, psionics has been poorly understood by the people of um, Vandara, mainly because, well, the dragons were the only ones left, and the Outer Lords either died off or ditched the place or something. I ended up leaving it a bit of a mystery what ultimately happened to them. But another people, the Clipoth, have recently come to, or, um, come to Orin with dubious connections to the Outer Lords, they are psionic specialists, and this has led to a bit of a rediscovery of psionics that has dramatically impacted society in a lot of ways. More and more peoples are awakening psionic powers, and that is causing some major cultural shifts, especially because these abilities end up leading to them perceiving the worlds in dramatic and wild new ways. Um, meanwhile, a lot of other psionic creatures are being discovered within the depths that all of a sudden the people of Orin and Vandar are figuring out, wait a minute, there are things in here that are tied to the clip off. How do we use that to actually fight off the clip? Mm -hmm. And also there are institutions that are taking advantages of psionics weirdness that um, are, like, posing themselves as new mages in contrast to, well, the stodgy old wizard, cleric, and psychic traditions that have had millennia to build up followings and to make their practice popular in the setting. Mm -hmm. And so in a lot of ways, psionics is a question of old versus new, as well as different methods um, and different views of what is to be understood and appreciated when it comes to power. Yeah. And do you, when it comes to the mechanics end of, end of things, mm -hmm. are there just, are there just as much, is there just as much emphasis on making them feel different in that sense, as much as there is on the narrative side of things? Yes, actually. Um, there are numerous variant rules presented in Arc Forge that expand even further on the um, Psionics is Different rules that were published in both Expanded Psionics Handbook 3.5 and Ultimate Psionics for Pathfinder. There are, if GMs want to go with them, more dramatic non-interaction policies about how Magics and Psionics can be pushed further apart. And I should mention that Akasha... For those of you who are familiar with Dreamscar Press's Akashic Mysteries series and Lost Spheres Publishing's continued version of it, Studio M's as well, those um, have similar rules that allow you to give psionics and Akasha alike a flavor that distinguishes it from magic in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like you, you've you've seen the attempts at. Um... At psionics mechanically in se in several D twenty games over the years, no doubt. Mm -hmm. All the way from second edition up to fifth edition. Um, and as 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 questionable as they were in second edition, in earlier mm -hmm. versions they were worse. <laughs> like the mm -hmm. like in like in like in first where there was that whole separate psionic combat system. 
Yep, that has caused me some serious pain when trying to convert up first edition psionic monsters. Oh, and the, and the whole thing of oh, you can you can get you can get disin you can get disintegrate stupidly early. Yeah, you're blo mm -hmm. and we balanced it by the fact that you're spending most of your psionic points to use it. Yep. Which, okay, yeah, but counterpoint, it's still disintegrate. It's yep. still it's still a one stop shop for making your GM's B bag look at the beholder that they've got at the end of the dungeon and going, that beholder does not exist anymore. Mm hmm So, it's it's kind it's kind of it's kind of like trying to patch a bro a a broken arm with a band aid. Yeah, don't get me started on the whole like taking ten actions in one turn stuff that we're involved with psychic combat. Yeah. Yeah, um whenever whenever people talk talk about how the, how the favorite edition that they grew up with it was perfectly balanced, I laugh. <laughs> or, <laughs> no, no. Or no. especially when they tell me that there is nothing wrong with fighters not being powerful. In that case, they can go f fucking fuck off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, yep. I will. I will admit the first hinting that I that I heard when it came to Arc Forge was when I was diving headfirst into the Spheres system. <laughs> Obviously, that's mm -hmm. how you and I know each other. Here, but yep. with with that with that said, when it comes, you talk on the Kickstarter about how it's adding new spheres for both spheres of power and spheres of might. Mm -hmm. Now, going going into Going into detail on each would be a bit would be a bit lengthy. So, what would you say would be some of the highlights or some of the things that it's adding to the sphere system that you happen to really like? Well, the big new one is the Technomancy sphere, which was originally introduced in Spheres of Influence, the fourth book of Arc Forge. Um, yes, the pun was very much intentional. Um, and was designed as a Spheres expansion specifically designed for interacting, interacting with machinery and with construct. I took a lot of influence from Shadowrun and built a lot of mechanics around being able to create magical programs that you could plant inside various objects and use it to manipulate them. Mm -hmm. And that's the basis of the Sphere. In terms of... Other spheres, the combat spheres originally had the pilot sphere in Spheres Left Behind. But as more and more stuff has been released for um, Spheres of Guile and Spheres of Might, uh, I ultimately decided that the pilot sphere would be better off being split up. So I really just split it up among the athletics, artifice, and equipment spheres rather than like having a second new sphere that was really just a few things that were hodgepodge together to deal with the mech rules that I've just rewritten from the ground up. Which that def that definitely makes sense. Mm -hmm. But even beyond that, um, there are at least 20 different spheres that have gotten some new talents mm -hmm. um, between power, might, and guile. Have Death. traditions oh. gotten gotten expansions, or has that not changed? Um, like I have not changed how traditions in any sort have been altered, but I have definitely included a few new magic and combat traditions based on some of the cultures on Vandara and well, how people who um, who are within them approach both combat and magic. I might do more down the line, but I do think that um, tradi um, like tradition should be in the hands of players, at least to some degree, so they can really help to define what is their character in Bandara, or Orin, or the Beyond. Yeah, in the same in the same vein, kind kind of a kind of a side question to the traditions thing. Do you have? Do you have a few sample traditions that you're putting in to kind of give an example of how to use that tradition system to fit in Absolutely. the setting? Um, like I said, the um, main traditions that I provided were examples based on 
some of the locations on Vandara with unique abilities tied to their specific histories. Mm -hmm. For example, um, ooh, what's a good one? Valtros is a culture that, or it's a region where a lot of people are accustomed to using repurposed equipment and essentially just scrounging together like whatever they can find from old derelict materials. So it has a lot of emphasis on the equipment sphere for having a wide variety of weapon proficiencies and generally th um, mechan and the berserker sphere for just being able to survive in the wilderness. Um, on the opposite end, you have Taurun, which is a very industrialized, very organized military society where I gave them a lot of options regarding firearms and protective magic to emphasize that they well, do kind of have a divine mandate that is what their like military society and wit um and imperialist ambitions are coordinated around. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and I'm I'm guessing that I'm guessing the sample traditions thing applies just as much to the might end of things as it does to the power. You are correct. Mm-hmm. I have not expanded them for Guile, mainly because we ultimately decided not to do a um, threefold tradition for Spears of Guile, but we do have the combined traditions for magic and um, for might, magic and might in the tradition section. That and um, Guile is relatively new compared to power and might. That is correct, and I should mention we were much more cramped for word count on those books. <laughs> I mean, you're you're expanding the you're expanding the skill system, so that was always yeah. going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there are still some things that I'm saving for future books mm -hmm. that I came up with for that one. Yeah. Now, as as I understand it, the mm -hmm. the whole the whole bulk of Ar of Arc Forge is be is being combi is being combined and revised into these two books. The yep. player, the player's compendium, mm -hmm. and the universe cyclopedia. That is correct. Um, now, given given that, would you would you say that ev that even for people who already have some of the Arc Forge books, this is more of a director's cut of some of that material? I would absolutely say that. Um, everything from the original um, twelve Arc Forge books is being revised and replay tested right now to make sure that it is all better balanced, that it makes more sense to people, and that it, well, is all in one convenient place rather than you having to flip through a dozen different books. On top of that, um, the Kickstarter stretch goals have been very successful so far. Mm -hmm. And we have been doing pretty well in terms of adding new content. Um, the first two stretch goals are completed, which means that we have a brand new system for um, custom building your own weapons with a lot of new weapon enhancements and new weapon bases. Um, we have a whole bunch of new psionic powers, um, spheres, talents, and spells that we added. And I think we've got at least 15 new monsters that we are adding to the GM side of things. Mm -hmm. um, not to mention, for those familiar with Ships of Skyborne and the vehicle rules there, we're going to be doing an expansion on that for star um, for starships. That is 100% new to this project. It was not in any of the prior Arc Forge books, and I imagine that there are going to be a lot of wild scenarios built on that. And the now there in the players' compen compendium, there's mm -hmm. going to be two classes that are in them. And obvious for mm -hmm. th for those who are already familiar with Arc Forge, the, this is probably not treading new ground. But since every book is someone's first, I think it's important to go into these. The two new classes that are being in there are the Helmsman and the Hive Mind. Hive Mind and. I'd like to take a moment to dive into what those two classes are going to bring to the table, what their particular play style is. Mm-hmm. 
Well, the Helmsman is um, was introduced in Arcforge Technology Expanded, and the idea behind that one is that it is it was built to use the new mech rules that were introduced in the book. It is designed around having a custom mech or vehicle that you pilot, and this is coupled with unique Akashic abilities that allow you to just go all Star Trek and divert power to various areas of your mech in order to enhance its abilities. You can pump your juice into your into your weapons to amplify your damage. You can pump it into the thrusters to jack up your speed or to the shields to make it last just a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. Um, and I played Helmsman in a multi-year campaign, and it was just so much fun just, like, having those unique decisions to do every turn while just really hamming up the, like, Star Trek angle of it, where it felt like I was, like, in the, ch- in the captain's chair, like, diverting power to, like, wherever the resources were needed most in order to, like, take advantage of just whatever things I had on hand in a given situation. Mm-hmm. The second one is actually not a returning class, but a brand new one, um, the Hive Mind. It is a class that is built around its signature Nanite Cloud, which it can similarly use in um, Akasha to augment. The Nanite Cloud can take various forms, ranging from different tools that can be shaped on, on the fly to a immersion in your body that you can use to enhance your abilities, set of their Armstrong style, to a few other, um, um, what was, oh yeah, to just clouds and summons that can be maneuvered to fly around the battlefield and interfere with things. Mm-hmm. It's another really unique take on Akasha, how it can be handled, and I think that it'll create some really fun gameplay dynamics. It's not yet in playtest, but mm-hmm. will be released as part of the next playtest volume alongside the Akashic Veils. And given that it's nanomachine formed, for whatever reason, the image of Spider's Man came up in my mind. Yep. Not mm-hmm. Spider-Man, Spider's Man. <laughs> exactly. A, a Spider-Man that is a hive mind of spiders. Yes, you can do exactly that. There is actually an archetype that actually transforms you into a living swarm of nanites. Mm-hmm. Um, now, I I do want to get into archetypes, but before I do that, let's talk a bit about mechs, since adding mechs mm-hmm. into a lot of D20-based games on paper is going to be a tricky affair. It has been. Because it's very tempting to make mechs just another form of vehicle, but that doesn't quite fit the fantasy of what yeah, people think it's... when they think of a mech pilot. Yeah, when people are like trying to do things with vehicles, especially in Pathfinder or other D20 games, it results in something that is kind of clunky because it uses a bit of an alternate rule system. Reconciling the scope of like something like a large like warship or a even just something like a carrier or truck or tank it tends to make things complicated so our solution when we redid max um with the new arc forge is rather than just trying to add on a bunch of things we just decided you know what your mech suit your tank whatever it is it's your armor now you wear it it provides a bonus to ac it alters your stats it alters your size and it is effectively a part of your body for how fights are resolved. Similar to other equipment, it's possible for people to directly um, sunder your mech in order to try and crack it. Or they can just hit you so hard that you get jostled around inside of the mech and you die before it breaks. Mm-hmm. And that, of course, opens up the option of joinking someone unconscious out of the mech and then piloting it yourself. Yeah. Um, I, th- I think the other thing to ask, just because I, I love me some mecha, I've mm-hmm. repeatedly taken shots at a few, at a few um, content creators who kept insisting that mecha is dead. Oh. 
which I which I'm think um with one of them I sent I sent them a message saying mm -hmm. um I hear I hear there's a restaurant not too far from here that serves good crow. Yep. <laughs> but mm -hmm. How big of a mech are we, are we talking? Are we talking Votom size big? Are we talking Grandpa Gundam? Are we talking Armored Core? We are talking, depending on how much, um, how you want to build your mech, it can be anything from an Iron Man suit to a Pacific Rim level kaiju fighting mech. Yeah, not on that note. Let me check how tall Gypsy Danger is. Since like we're talking skyscraper size mechs here, like as it occupies a sixty by sixty foot square on the map. Gypsy Danger is just shy of eighty meters tall, or two hundred and sixty mm -hmm. feet. So yeah, like if you're going for like the macro colossal mechs, like I think you are able to hit that level. And. Given all the kaiju references with Gypsy da with um, Pacific Rim, it's funny that it's that it's at close to eighty meters because there was a story about how Ifikube left Toho because he, because in his words he doesn't score eighty meter monsters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but now, give, given that, I want to shift over into archetypes, and obviously, going into all fifty archetypes would be. Uh, would be a bit excessive. So yes. what I what I what I'm instead going to do is I'm going to go through the I'm going to go through the class list, the pr the main class list off of Archives of Nethys. And mm -hmm. you can you can tell me if there is an ar if there is a new archetype for that particular cl that particular class or if there or if there's multiple ones pick a one that you happen to like. If there isn't, mm -hmm. we'll just move right on to the next one. All right. I could just list off all of the classes that get giant mecha. <laughs> Tempting, but no. So, all right. Alchemist. Ooh, um, Alchemist. We had some fun new options there. Um, the Psionic Alchemist was the first one that I came up with, but um, yeah, which basically replaces the alchemical extracts with psionic powers, and definitely lets you lean into a few. Rather unorthodox build by pulling on heavily on the psychic war on the psychic warrior power list. Mm -hmm. um, some of my favorites there were essentially turning it the king the alchemist's king of smack build into something utterly obscene using things like horrific transformation, claws of the beast, and bite of the wolf. Um, but in terms of some of the new alchemist options that are unique to the class. Um, We've added a bunch of new stuff involving bombs, and specifically the ability to utilize some other classes' grenade-related abilities with Alchemist Bomb. Alright. Mm-hmm. Anti-Paladin. Oh boy, we've got a lot there! Um, Anti-Paladin is the first class to get a giant mech suit. Um, the Arcforge Champion. And beyond that, um, a whole bunch of new cruelties, a new pledge for the Avowed called the Pledge of Many, which longtime anti-Paladin fans may recognize, and also rules for a psionic version of the anti-Paladin that is pledged to either an Aberration Lord or a Clip-Off. Uh, all right. Mm -hmm. Arcanist. Uh, nothing specific for Arcanist, but we do have some new spells if you want me to share those. Uh, oh, I'm more I'm more leaning towards f towards features than spells for this for this kind of thing. All right, I can wait on spells. All right, Barbarian. Hmm. Not I did I get anything here for Barbarian? I don't think I did. Um. I mean, yeah, no, I don't really have any Barbarian coverage for this one. All right. I guess because, like, it is a little bit anachronistic in a high-tech setting. Mm -hmm. Granted, Thundar does still exist, so... Mulligan? I mean, you've... Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's I'll, I'll pull a Mulligan. There's, ar there's already rage-like eff like, like effects in, the s in Spheres of Might, so... Yeah, and there is also already... I, I just remembered the high-tech Barbarian that existed in Iron Gods. So, 
you've got I think options. The base is there. Yep, the bases there are well covered. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. Bard. Ooh. Hmm. We do actually have, um, I believe, one or two new bardic performances in here. Um, at the very least, we have a sizable number of new bard spells. Not to mention a bard helmsman arch um, combination archetype, which I have used to hilarious effect in some of my games. But that's a story for another time, unless you want to hear it. We'll we'll eventually get we'll eventually get to it. Um, mm -hmm. At the very least, we have an excuse to not have the bard bone everybody, though that's going to happen anyways. Mm. You'd be surprised. I've had other characters bone everybody in my games. I don't... Getting screwed over by the dice gods doesn't count. The dice gods hate everyone. No, I mean, typically, like, it's either the witch or the magus in my games who tends to screw people. Figuratively and literally? Yes. Good answer. Oh. Blood Rager. Ooh, um... Yeah, we got some new Blood Rager bloodlines. Most notably, the Serpentine bloodline. Um, this one is based around you being tied to the Naga, the, um, the Serpent Folk, or, in many ways, the Scaled Peoples of um, the setting, which has a bunch of abilities that range from you being able to turn into a giant snake to basically having swarms of stakes spill from your wounds every time you get hurt. No step on snack. No step on snack indeed. Um. Brawler. Ooh. Gonna have to take another mulligan on that one. Right. Cavalier. Yes! Cav new Cavalier option, Bannerless Knight. Essentially, this is the idea. Um, I brought up Valtros earlier on, and the Bannerless Knight is kind of an embodiment of that by being a Cavalier with a unique ability called Pledge of Convenience, which allows him to literally change his order abilities at the start of every day. All right. Mm -hmm. Also, the teamwork abilities are replaced with solo tactics from the Inquisitor, allowing the Cavalier to just take advantage of their allies rather than actually coordinating with them. How unexpected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> cleric. Let's see. Uh, we actually have a new cleric domain, um, a new cleric archetype called the Dragon Cleric. This one is based around you worship one of the Elder Dragons, the Elden Worms, as they're called in the setting. And you have the unique ability to summon dragons. Um, this can range from wormlings at level 9 to just straight up being able to uh, drop a mature adult red dragon on somebody at level 17. Just some... Also, uh, you can turn your channel energy attempts into breath weapons. <laughs> just, su just surprise... Dr a surprise mm -hmm. dragon is the kind of move that Usakar Creed would be proud of. Yep. You know what with his. Or we could do it one better. Multiple surprise dragons. <laughs> Just pulls clothes due to tactical genius. Mm-hmm. And all right. Even though you've pro you've probably seen the meme about how the enemy can be just strolling by and all of a sudden a warhound titan shows up. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um. Hit me with the next one. Druid. Druid? That one also gets a mech. And it takes a bit of a different form than you would think. Remember the guy from Avatar The Last Airbender who he had the giant plant mech and had the famous line, pants are an illusion and so is death? Yeah. Um... Yep, that is what the mech druid does. I'm the Lorax. I speak for the trees. Except for these ones, they speak Vietnamese. <laughs> yep, or just in this case, this one is just a giant wooden mech that just crushes you. Yeah, I've I've dealt with one, I've dealt with those. I um, <laughs> mm -hmm. I had a I had a player who who had the, who yep. had that kind of thing. It it was it was more it was not full size mech. It was more Votom sized. Mm -hmm. Um, he called his mech tiny. 
Nice. <laughs> um, why he called it tiny, even though even though it was thirty feet tall, I have no idea. I think it's supposed to be ironic. <laughs> I'll give you props for the Mad World reference. Oh my gosh, you got it! <laughs> what most people on your table don't? You're the first person that like I've ever seen at any of my tables to recognize Mad World, and I've brought it up a lot. Shame on them. <laughs> Filth like them should be keel hauled and plank walked. Um, fighter. All right. Um, this one, like I'm not even trying to hide the reference. It's the Road Warrior, and basically the class is designed to be Mad Max. You get a custom vehicle, you gain the ability to push it into overcharge, and because it's part of the aesthetic, you are proficient with dire flails and spike chains. To play Devil's Advocate, if you've ever read through the prototype one-shot version of Berserk, that version of Guts <laughs> is very much channeling Mad Max. Oh, I've read it. I know. So you're Plus... Kenshiro was ch was channeling Mad Max as well, <laughs> in, mm -hmm. in more in more ways than one. So you're in good company. Yep. The way the way I see it, people are going to put two and two together, inevitably. So best yeah. to um best best to <laughs> just um, be up head it off about at, it. <laughs> head it off at the pass. Like I made a covert ops class, and I didn't even try and hide the fact that it was meant to be the Turks. Mm-hmm. Also, as a matter of fact, we got art for the Road Warriors, and it is something spectacular. If you want me to send it, send it over to you quick. Yeah, do that. Although, I might I might troll some people one of these days and, and say I put in a war Road Warrior class, and they're assume they're assuming Mad Max, and then it's in reality Hawk and Animal. Mm -hmm. I thought you were going to say like a warrior that creates roads. No, but that would be that wouldn't be a bad idea. That wouldn't be a bad idea, mm -hmm. especially since in the actual play that I'm do that I'm doing, there is a god of railroads. Here it is. Put it up. <laughs> I won't be able to put it up, at, but yeah, that tra <laughs> that tracks. <laughs> yeah. As an as an aside, I've I've said for the I've said for the longest amount of time. Get the get the twisted metal guys and ha and throw and throw the Mad Max IP at them and tell them to have at it. You will have mm -hmm. all my money. All right then. Uh, I'll see what strings I can pull. <laughs> I'm just I'm just say, I'm just saying that's su it's such a natural fit. I I said the same thing about say. Give the cars in Cyber in Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven over to the Need for Speed guys and see what and let them play things out. Mm hmm. But oh, Gunslinger. The, not really anything in terms of specific class options, but let's just say that I've added at least four new types of guns. All right. Mm -hmm. You know, to probably let me put it this way: if you can, like, you're... whatever ridiculous sci-fi weapon you can come up with, I guarantee you that new weapon crafting system can get it to you. Noisy cricket. Yep. Good. Does it still knock you on your ass? Yes. Also good. Mm hmm. And it's called the noisy cricket. You get you've got to deliver with a name like that. Mm hmm. But. Oh, Hunter. Hunter, um... No Hunter option... Oh, yeah, wait. We just had the... We did just straight up give the ability for anyone who has an animal companion to turn it into a mech. Mm -hmm. So if you want to just straight up make your Hunter into a Power Ranger, you are free to do that. Someone's gonna do it. Um... I know someone's gonna do it. Inquisitor. Um, let's see here. Gonna pull a mulligan on that one. Oh. Honestly, Inquisitor's pretty well covered, especially after what we added with Spears of Guile. Mm -hmm. Oh. Mm -hmm. Kineticist. Uh, pulling a serious mulligan on that one. I, I do not touch that class. 
No, you you have an alternative appro approach to um ma to mag to um psionics, anyways. So I can mm -hmm. see why not. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Magus. What? Magus? Once again, giant robot. Mm -hmm. And, and whole... this one actually has a few unique abilities, namely the ability to actually blow their arcane pool points to augment their mech in a similar means to the helmsman. And, of course, the ability to use all of their weapon-enhancing abilities to just power up their mech. Yeah, that cer that certainly fits. Mm -hmm. If um, you want to go full Gurren login, you can do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just, not, just, not full, just not full end of series, because I don't think you're going to have a mech the size of the damn universe. Oh. Not without Mythic, anyway. No, we deal with we bring Mythic into the situation. Then yeah, that um, go mm -hmm. go right ahead. Um, medium. Ooh, uh, we actually um got a whole bunch of new medium spirits that are tied to um several things historically in our forge. Um, for those familiar with the um, psionic medium that was introduced in Dreams Card Press's Occult Psionics, which I highly recommend. We've got three new zeitgeists that are based on elements within Vandar. Heron Lu, the Outer Enigma, Annalene, the Deific Void, and Ramtik, the Eternal Cycle. And they, they are each fun in their own way. Mm -hmm. um, mesmerist. I... Already covered way too much stuff with that one in Spheres of Guile, but um, I will say that um, while Mesmerist isn't getting support, the Spheres version of the class, the Elicitor, got a new archetype that is based around like forming like psychic connections to the Seven Logi, and I am abs that is absolutely one of the archetypes that I am most. All right, that ma that makes sense. Oh, mm -hmm. monk. Of course, this one is going to be relevant to my interest. I can't imagine why. Mm -hmm. Sadly, going to have to take a mulligan on monk-specific options, but um, let's just say that monks are going to find a lot to love in the feet in the feet section. All right, I can I can get that. Yep, I mean monks do love using their feet. There are multiple ways I could take that. Take them in as many ways as you can. <laughs> but the but um ninja. Um Yeah, that's not that's another one that I didn't really cover because well I didn't really feel a need for it. Like, Ninja has been pretty well supported by most of the existing options. All right. In terms of the other Paizo... Um, Occultist? Oh, I had fun with Occultist. Um, uh, new, pan um, new Panoply, for uh, those of you who picked up um, Occult Realms and know what the Panoply system is. Um, Miracle Rites... No, it was in uh, Psychic Handbook. Um, but basically, like, this... There is a new one called the Miracle Rites Toolbox, which is built around being an occultist and augmenting the crap out of your equipment. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to slap metamagic feats on your wands? Now you can. Oh. Oracle. Oh... Two new, um, two new archetypes for Oracle. Um, there is the Depth Lord, which is based on um, like channeling the mysteries of the Maker's War and a lot of the deep aberrations. Um, also, gaining some unique abilities for being able to treat its spells as technological effects. And also just being able to steal spells from the Psychic spell list. And... 
The other one is the Primal Visionary, which is something I am honestly shocked has not been tried yet. An oracle that uses the druid spell list instead of the cleric. And who can also get a plant companion. Mm-hmm. Uh, spe- um, Paladin. Paladin gets a giant mech. Mm -hmm. That should be all I need to say. <laughs> but if you want to go further, I can explain more. Is it a case of a divine mech or something? Yes, it is actually a divine mech that um, actually, like, straight up has an angel as its AI. Oh, we know. Oh, well, we know it's not using the Glados voice. Mm-hmm. Um. Yep. I'm guessing Psychic is another one of those mulligans for reasons that the other men mentalist um classes aren't are mulligans. Yeah, and besides, there already was a lot of high high tech support for Psychic, even if it wasn't the best written. Mm -hmm. Um, Ranger. Oh yeah, Rangers. I sort of just created an archetype for it that I just called the Cowboy Bebop archetype because it lets you get both a vehicle and an animal companion, and you can have your animal companion drive the vehicle. <laughs> um, Rogue. Actually, ultimately, um, I don't think I actually did Rogue either, so I'm going to take a mulligan on that. All right. Uh, I'm guessing Samurai is getting a mulligan for the same reasons Ninja did. Yeah, and I already covered Cavalier. Mm -hmm. Um... Shaman. I... That's another one I didn't really cover. Alright. Oh. Mm -hmm. Shifter. Hard mulligan on that one. Um, well, yeah, no. I will say that the Spheres of Power Shifter is going to like some of the new talents. But the Paizo Shifter, no. Alright. Scald. Same reason as... Bar um, yeah, not really... Although I'm looking through like the remaining Paizo classes, the only ones that Yeah, the only ones that are noteworthy in terms of which ones they got were Slayer, which um gets a Fallout inspired archetype. Um the Vigilante, which just straight up becomes a Power Ranger. Like you can <laughs> like you can like board. switch into your alternate identity and use it to call your Megazord. Mm -hmm. oh. And that's about it for, like, direct um, yeah, engagement with the Paizo classes. Mm -hmm. The third party... Oh, and Spiritualist, which has a ghost mecha. <laughs> so, you d so you didn't touch um, Sorcerer? Mm, no, Sorcerer already had all the bloodlines that I wanted to cover. I just converted the other ones to Blood Rager. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I'm, gu I'm guessing there's a similar thing with, li with like, Wizard. Yeah. Oh. All right, that's st that's still qu that's still quite a wide variety, and obviously some yeah. obviously some of the classes in that list are the hybrids, which are giant mm -hmm. kit bashes. Yeah, but the bigger thing that I wanted to cover is that there's a lot more for third party classes. Um, more than half of the archetypes and class options in this book are actually not written for um like the original paizo classes but for either psionic classes from dreamscard press akashic classes from dreamscard and lost fears publishing um also studio m or um fears classes created by drop dead studios mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we've got some of the things on here we have the chain master soul knife which is basically built around like forming their to, um, forming their mind blade into a telekinetic chain that they can leverage in various ways. Um, there is... Yeah, let's see. The Id Delver, which is based on, like, tapping into the subconscious and using that to overcharge your psionic abilities. There is the... Um, ooh, the Meta Mechanic, which is a vitalist that is based on repairing objects in addition to healing people. Um, and there is the Cyborg Engineer Vizier, which is based on using in Akasha to power up their equipment. On the Sphere side of things, 
We've got um, a new strife for the um, Legends of the Spheres Dissident, um, Mortality versus Eternity. Um, those of you familiar with Starfinder of Solarion are going to find a lot to love there. The Technomancer Path for the Hedge Witch. Um, a, let's see here. Some new, uh, ooh boy, so many options, so little time. The, yeah, the Shixel Hand, which is a new dread, which is built around utilizing spheres for touch attacks. All of the psionic classes actually got some spheres options. Um, the Projectionist Voyager, which is built around pulling a bunch of stuff in from the Shadow Plane and jumping between places on the Shadow Plane. Um, and my personal favorite, the Spheres Wilder, known as the Stellar Echo which basically is built around summoning vi visages of fallen civilizations and weaponizing the forces of their collapse as the source of their power. It is a great concept. I had a lot of fun designing the archetype, and it also got some cool art, which would take me a little bit longer to dig out, but which I definitely think is one of the cooler pieces from the book. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh. And then there's oh, good. also a bunch of stuff for everything from Armager to Sentinel to Symbiote to Marksman. So, mm -hmm. if you are a fan of anything in the Spheres line or the Psionics line, you're going to find a lot to love here. Yeah. And... Now, give, now, given that, since you hinted at spells, I'd, I, let's dive a little bit into that. Oh. Alrighty then. Let me just crack so, it open here. There's quite, there's obviously there's going to be a lot of spells, and we can't we can't go into all of them at once. So uh -huh. what I'd instead like to go into is what's what some of your favorite spells that you, that have been added in, and also whether or not whether or not when it comes to psionic powers. If psionic powers are operate operate on their own categories, much like magic has these different spheres. Mm -hmm. Well, like I said, that's covered under the variant rules um, in terms of like how you want to have psionics and magic interact. And I have a lot more psionic powers in here than I do spells, but I do have quite a few fun ones in here among all of these. Um, in terms of spells, um, one of my personal favorites is Void Song, which basically creates an area that allows people to talk and breathe in space. Um, I imagine that's going to make for a lot of fun encounters. And then you have ooh, Beckoning, which is a psionic effect, which sends a signal to all creatures of a specific type within a range that could cross galaxies. The catch is you have absolutely no idea what's going to receive it. Let's see here. Coded Resurrection, which allows you to reanimate a dead creature as an AI. Ecological Alteration, which is basically some high-tech psionic terraforming. Mm -hmm. And... Hmm... Oh boy, so many. Re I'm just gonna look up what are the highest level nightmares in here and see what find and see what I find. Oh yeah, Armageddon, a blast spell with a range of one mile per level. Let me just say it's going to be a very memorable moment when that goes off. For memorable for 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 a long time for the person casting for the people targeted, um, a little bit less so probably. Yeah. Let's just say people are going to see the crater for a very long duration. Remember, no one argues with smoking craters. Indeed. But when mm -hmm. now, when it comes to 
when it comes to some of the some of the variant rules, you mentioned on the Kickstarter things like Akasha as Cybertech or armor penetration mm -hmm. or um, robot upgrades. What are some What are some yep. of the variant rules that would be in the universe cyclopedia that GMs could mess around with? Well, you've already mentioned Akasha as Cybertech, and I brought that one up earlier. It's straight up turning your um, Akasha system from magical energy into electricity that you can manipulate. Armor penetration is a more granular version of guns hit touch AC, which rather than just having them punch through all armor, it gives a whole bunch of weapons, guns included, a armor penetration rating, which allows them to punch through different amounts of armor. Like, for example, like a standard pepper box is gonna punch through, it's gonna bypass leather armor and it will go through, like, plate armor better than some melee attacks, but it's still gonna provide a sizable bonus. On the other hand, you fire a railgun at somebody, and chances are it's just gonna tear through their armor completely. Mm -hmm. Also got some new rules for plentiful charges, so that your batteries don't explode when you try and magically recharge them. Psionic um, interactions for spheres of power, in case you want to have psionic char spheres characters use psionic feats. Um, and, of course, um, the variant rules for psionics are different, which allows um, you to, rather than using magic item creation feats and magic-based effects for your um, psionic abilities, allows you to use technological effects to, use the, um, to utilize those. Things like craft technological item or like create drug rather than say the craft wondrous item. Yeah. Now, um, given what you mentioned with some of the gunslinger archetypes being able to make whatever crazy sci-fi weapon, I'm mm -hmm. is that to account for the fact that you're not using gunpowder anymore? Thus, some of the rules about misfiring and the like um, wouldn't be as appropriate. That is correct. Like. Having your guns explode in your face is not really going to happen when you have guns that use some of the more advanced um, resources for propulsion. We've got rules for electrical guns. Um, we've got rules for plasma-based weaponry. And there are plenty of ways that you should be able to mix and match things to ensure that you have not only the gun of your dreams, but also it works like you'd expect. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That certainly. In fact, makes, the. That certainly. Yeah. Makes in sense. fact, the armor penetration rules were, like, engineered specifically to avoid having to deal with the obnoxious misfire rules. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. With that, with that in, with that in, with that in mind, mm -hmm. is it it? When it comes to the firearms, is there go, is there going to be some setup regarding customizing them? So if so, if somebody wants to make the crazy ass gun that they've seen in a particular SF, they can. Yes, I have made sure that um, the enhan um, the like enhancement bonus and item creation property rules have been expanded dramatically to account for the sheer number of bizarre guns that people might come up with. Yeah. Now, since I joked about the noisy cricket, let's use that as an example. In mm -hmm. the in this um, sandbox that you've created, how would someone make the noisy cricket with both its benefits and its drawbacks? Well, let's see here. There is actually a specific drawback for equipment that will... Deal more damage, but send you flying whenever it's used. Mm -hmm. And if we use, like, the standard bolt pistol as the beginning for it, then first step would probably be swapping its damage type to Sonic. Yep. And then giving it a few other properties that ensure that it not only fires at a single target, but rather, let's go with a cone. That seems appropriate. Um, add in a property that causes all targets to risk being knocked over on a critical hit, or just being forced back. Maybe create an option where it just 
I don't know, screws up the terrain so that, like, everything in the blast radius becomes difficult terrain. And for good measure, add in a few abilities so that it can punch through hardness and just shatter things. Mm -hmm. that, would cer that would certainly fit. There doesn't seem to be a clip or, in or any sort of limit on that front. It's just every time you... F One, you're not going to be doing any sort of burst fire. It's single shot. It's just... Mm -hmm. You fire the thing, you get thrown 20 yards. <laughs> yep. Oh. And I'm not sure if you utilize it, but whenever it, com whenever it comes to that kind of thing, I always implement um, wall banging. Mm -hmm. Mostly because I used that with a couple un with a couple really dumb builds um, that involved a monk who had brass knucks that doubled as a ring of ram. Mm, <laughs> nice. You know, so just keep bullying him onto the wall and just keep and just keep hit just keep hitting him so he keeps getting bull rushed. Mm-hmm. Also I should mention Spheres of Might already has native support for rocket jumping, so if you wanna use that, you already have the tools for it. Mm -hmm. And since I made at least one forty K joke, I I suppose I have to dip into that. How would someone make the good old fashioned bolt gun? Literally, I literally named one of the weapons the bolt gun. <laughs> uh, or... Criminy. I'm cycling through too many goddamn tabs now. Story of my life. Here we go. Yep. Um, yeah, the penalty of trying to keep everything organized. Yeah. Start. Yeah, we'll start off with a... Fairly bait. Are we gonna go? Yeah, no. Let's go with the heavy ones. Heavy bolter is from the base, two d six damage, range two hundred feet, armor penetration six. Um, we can start tacking on more enhancements to increase its um to increase its ability to just shoot through things, up its damage a little bit more, and just for the fun of it. Let's add in the puncturing property so that it shoots lines through targets rather than stopping when it hits the first one. I I can cer I can certainly go with that, and somebody could probably um, mess around with that to mm -hmm. um ha to have the space equivalent of the infamous four bore. Yep. Hey, go with the wide shot property so you that you shoot a fifteen foot li wide line through everyone. Mm -hmm. In your way, uh, the four bore, if you don't know, is a is a real gun. <laughs> is a the full the full name is Christian Firearms fall, Falling blo Falling Lock Four Bore Rifle. Mm -hmm. The barrel of it is one inch in diameter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, and it has like two hundred two hundred plus pounds of recoil. Yeah, you could definitely build that. <laughs> I mean. I'd probably, I'd probably have, I, if I was building it myself, I'd probably have it that every time you fire the thing, you take non-lethal damage, mm -hmm. because it's the equivalent of getting kicked in the shoulder by a horse. Yeah. Pro tip: Don't get kicked by a horse. Doesn't, it's not a good idea. I've heard stories. <laughs> oh, I've known folk who got kicked, who got kicked in the chest by a horse. It, it's not pretty. But. Yep. When it come now, I can This was kind of answered with the whole director's cut thing, but would this be ju would this be just as viable for people coming into Arc Forge for the first time as it would be Absolutely. for people who are a bit more seasoned with it? Yeah, I, I, like it doesn't matter if this is your first time hearing about Arc Forge or if you've been following it since the original playtest drop way back in. Oh gosh, what was it? 2014, 2015? Mm -hmm. You will definitely find something here, and everything in this book has been either compiled or rewritten to catch you up to speed. Yeah, you mentioned that there's a good amount of support for other th for other third party releases. Is mm -hmm. is that part of the reason why why as part of the add on collections there's PDFs there's PDFs and books from the Mythic series as well as 
stuff like Alien Bestiary and Alien Codex. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, Alien Bestiary and Alien Codex are definitely for people who want more spacefaring villains, or, heck, more spacefaring PCs. Mm -hmm. um, Mythic is getting a lot of support in here because there are not only new Mythic abilities and new Mythic spells, but also a fair number of new Mythic creatures. In particular, a lot of the stretch, a lot of the stretch goal ones are Mythic and... Then, of course, there are the infamous epic-level clip-off lord bosses, which definitely gained a bit of a following after they were initial, initially released in Ravages of the Clip-Off as both insetting menaces and absolute party butcherers. Mm -hmm. I can, I can certainly get, I can certainly get that. Yep. Now. With that said, you're, you've referred to this as a quick starter, and since, since you're mm -hmm. talking about a a um, a three week a three week Kickstarter, is this going to be a case where the turnaround is going to be relatively quick compared to other Kickstarter? well comparatively or not as much? It's somewhat quick because a lot of it already has been written. Um, all of the non-stretch goal stuff was already initially written before the, the Kickstarter was released. And some of the stuff has is definitely being rewritten as a result of playtesting. We are going through pretty much all of the stuff on the open beta, which is available um, on... Uh, it's going to be linked. It's linked on the Kickstarter as well as on Giant in the Playground. And world and a number of other sites where people can contribute or just look at things. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's pretty much it. We're fairly confident that we are going to be able to hit our stretch goals um, in that amount of time. We are getting pretty darn close to the final stretch, which, if you don't mind me saying, I would love to talk about it. Yeah, let's let's go into that. So, um, the final stretch goal, which we are still going to, is a bit of a new idea with, Leg with Legendary that I ended up pitching them. And this is going to be us testing the waters in a new area by actually supporting stuff for Pathfinder Infinite. Um, the main idea that I had with this was talking about several aspects of the Arcforge mythology and the cosmology of the beyond and how they intersect with Galerion. The book itself is going to be called Deposition of Godhead, and it is going to be a new book done in conjunction with a number of veteran Paizo writers, which brings the mechanics introduced in Arcforge, the mechs, the psionics, the akasha, the spheres into Galerion with new writing material for that, in addition to two brand new prestige classes and a whole bunch of new character options and monster options for people who want to use Galerion in conjunction with the Arcforge setting. Mm -hmm. Folks who are familiar with Art Galerion's lore, I imagine will find a lot of things interesting in here with how we have contextualized things like the gods, the planes, and Galerion's history within the larger story of the beyond. And that's going to have some fun details as well for people who like want to hear about like how certain nations like Cheliax, Anduron, and Berizia are responding to the, well, the realization that there are some kind of dramatic cosmic forces in the forms of the Logi that have influenced the setting's histories in ways they aren't fully aware of, and that are becoming increasingly prevalent in, well, the Revelation Crisis as it's being called. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get that. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that said, 
what do you see as the page count for Player's Compendium and for Universe Cyclopedia, respectively? Rough Eyeball is somewhere between 350 and 400 pages each. And I, I could see Cyclopedia being a bit beefier because it's got to condense a lot of the setting material. And this is oh, and gosh. since you're dealing with multiple planets, this is going to be a big yeah. ass setting. Let me put it this way. I have the um, Google Doc for all of the lore alone in a single document, and it is 222 pages long. Mm -hmm. And that is before we get monsters and variant rules. Yeah, I can, <laughs> I can certainly get that. And mm -hmm. as far as a release window, are you thinking this fall? Yes, our approximations are going to be for September. Mm -hmm. And the playtesting is going to take place over the next 10 weeks or so. We still have um, eight more volume. Yeah, we still have eight more um, rounds to go through. And with an expectation of releasing one, vo um, one round of the playtest every two weeks, that's probably going to be at least three more months and then of course there's going to be the whole nightmare of getting it edited getting it laid out and when you put all that together my guess is that we're going to be seeing a september or at the very least fall release mm -hmm. well september is in fall so <laughs> mm -hmm. well dep yeah. depending on where you are because some because some places like where i am yeah. fall does not exist Mm -hmm. There's just winter and not winter. Yeah. Oh. Or also, it's... greetings to everyone in the Southern Hemisphere. <laughs> I, I, do, I, I do love when some of my down south friends come up to vi come up to visit me during the during like January mm -hmm. or the like, and they get that first yep. blast of cold air. <laughs> oh gosh. <laughs> I know I sh I, I know I shouldn't laugh, but. When the, when they're giving you, grief I mean, I for, laugh. It's hilarious. Well, for one, um, <laughs> Mel Brooks once said, "Tragedy is when I cut my finger. Comedy is when you fall into an open sewer hole and die." Mm -hmm. And two, and two, when you have to deal with months upon months of them needling you about, "Ha ha, you're up, you're up there freezing, and it's nice and it's nice and warm down here." Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm gonna get I'm gonna get my licks in when I have the chance. I mean, when the when there's those flash freezes over in Texas, I feel bad because they don't have the infrastructure to deal with it. Yeah. But on the other hand, <laughs> oh. Yeah. It's one of those laughing at a car crash moments. Yeah. Every everybody knows that it's always funny when it happens to somebody else, and mm -hmm. no matter how much someone says that slipping on a banana peel isn't funny, if you saw someone slip, you would laugh. Every, and besides, everybody laughs at the Darwin Awards. Same principle. Actually, my thought is, like, who leaves out banana peels anymore? The people who are littering typically aren't the ones eating bananas. I never left out banana peels. I, I just... I just made... I just made... Um, I just took lunch trays, filled them full of snow, and laid them around my roommate's bed. Oh, yikes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, he steps out of bed, and the first thing he steps in is snow. Oof. Oh. I mean there there has been there's been that or the whole rigging the kitchen floor with D fours by the pound. Mm. Ow. Okay, that 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 I'm pretty sure like constitutes a crime. <laughs> um not when not when he not when he does not when he started it. Remember, the difference between a metal D four and a caltrop is strictly semantic. I didn't use I you I didn't use pl I didn't use um pewter or met or metal ones. They were all they're all pla they're all plastic. They weren't spiked. Um Well there was just a lot Then you won't get investigated by the Hague. <laughs> it was Um it was it was just a it was just a case of good of good old fashioned prank war. Mm-hmm. Oh. Because everybody has everybody's had their own version of prank war in one form or another. I just go a little bit further with it. <laughs> but wow. with 
now I, I suppose one of the things I, sh I should have asked when it came to the con when it came to the mech concept is mm -hmm. do you plan on having a s in the books do you plan on having a separate sheet specifically for tracking mechs because if upgrades are involved that could be a bit tricky honestly like I see like the mech is effectively the extension of your character mm -hmm. and as a result like any upgrades that you possess are effectively going to be character upgrades that apply so long as you're wearing the mech I I can get I can get that mm -hmm. I just, I know that some campaign settings will have their own variant of the character sheet so I figured I'd ask yeah that no we tried that with the initial release and the result was Way too much confusion. Confusion in the case of they didn't know what they didn't know whether or not they could use their old character sheets on this or confusion as in the additive mech rules were way too complicated to parse and honestly were kind of broken in a lot of cases. Hmm. I've done my best to simplify it and to make it so that they don't rip the game in half whenever they show up. Fair. Uh, with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my mm -hmm. temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. All right. It's been and a pleasure. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is mm -hmm. always open. As I yep. often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. All righty then. Thank you, Mildra, and also a special shout out to some of the other folks who have been crucial in getting Arc Forge this far. Thank you to Jason Nelson for getting everything together for this project and for organizing the Kickstarter. Thank you to James Ray for his work on the Hive Mind class. Um, and a very big thank you to my editor, Leona Maple, who has done some fantastic work in helping me rework a lot of the complicated and messy lore of Arc Forge into something cool and evocative. All three of you are incredibly awesome people. All three of you have been tremendous helps on this project, and... I very much hope that y'all can share in my success when this finally comes out. Mm -hmm. And I, like I said, I will look forward to that. Mm -hmm. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming yeah. monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! See y'all around!